Dr. Marco Samoyi, and he's going to talk about EEG fingerprinting. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Marco, and I'm presenting the FitPool method, a new EEG fingerprinting method for transferring e fMRI based neurofeedback interventions to EEG setups. Um, this work has been conducted in the University of Coimbra in Portugal. Okay, so basically what is neurofeedback? We, we just take the signal a measurement from a specific brain process of a subject, and we feed that information back to the participant so it tries to self-regulate its own brain act activity. Um, this process can usually be done with the uh, neuroimaging method. So here we compare two neuroimaging modalities, the fMRI and the EEG. The fMRI-based uh, neurofeedback, we have a, a very high spatial resolution, which gives us a good anatomic val uh, anatomical validity, but we have a low te temporal resolution and most of all, we have an inflexible setup that is very expensive. So if when we are talking about um, a, a method that we want to use for intervention and for rehabilitation, um, this can get very expensive. However, on the EG side, we have a very low spatial resolution, which gives us poor anatomical validity. But in contrast, we have a high temporal resolution and it provides us with a flexible setup, which is very inexpensive and we can do remotely. We can go uh, to the patient's homes and do the, the interventions there, which we cannot do with the fMRI. Um, so this leads to two different, the, the different characteristics of the EEG modalities led to different characteristics on the methods used for neurofeedback. On fMRI based, we have uh, usually localized regions. We define a region of interest and we try to modulate the bold signal on that region a long time. However, uh, in contrast on the EEG neurofeedback approaches, we usually use more broad rhythmic modulations where we participants try to modulate um, the frequency bands of the, the signal. The fMRI-based approach is much more recent. We're talking about one, two decades. Uh, while on the EEG base, we have did for the uh, 50 to 70 years uh, in the literature. Um, however, uh, the EEG setup provides um, uh, still poor evidence of effect, while the, the fMRI-based approach start to show some promising results. Um, however, due to the constraints I talked earlier, uh, the number of sessions per study is much different. So on the fMRI-based approaches, we have one to five sessions at most on the literature, while on the uh, EEG, um, EEG uh, neurofeedback, we have usually from 30 to 50 sessions, it's fairly common to find. Um, so. Our idea was to transfer, to develop an fMRI-based neuro, neurofeedback intervention and try to transfer it to EEG. How, do you, how did we aim to do this? We acquire simultaneously EEG and fMRI signal on the participants doing the fMRI neurofeedback intervention. We with the, uh, with the data acquired simultaneously, we try to predict the bold activity on the, right, on the ROI uh, region based only on EEG data. And with that model, we then are able to use and do the same task, fMRI-based uh, neurofeedback, but using an EEG setup outside of MRI. So this is the main idea for that we developed a neurofeedback protocol where we use uh, apply to 10 healthy participants. We localize the, the posterior uh, superior temporal sulcus region uh, with a stringent localizer. 
And we conducted one neurofeedback session of bold modulation on this region using uh, imagery of facial expressions to increase the activity on that region. So with this, we aim it to, to provide the feasibility and we published this paper on the neuroscience journal. With that data, we looked in the literature and we found that there is this group on Tel Aviv which uh, uses developed this method called the electrical fingerprint where they they use the power on different uh, frequency bands on the previous 12 seconds of the signal and use that to predict the activity on the on of the the bold activity on the ROI um, with this method, they have already published several uh, in, uh, papers where they use the EEG method transferred from the, the fMRI. Um, so they are using it clinically very often. So we were excited because it seemed to be a good method for us to, to use. Um, we then thought on improving the method. So we, we thought instead of only using the power, try other features from the linear and also the nonlinear um, feature space. So we tested different frequency bands. We do it on the scalp signal and also on the uh, source signal. We reconstructed the time courses on the source space. Um, and then we used the same method they did for the um, dealing with the hemodynamic delay on the fMRI, the delays method, but also compared it with the HRF, uh, the commonly used uh, HRF convolution. And also we tried to do a multiple HRF convolution where we defined HRF's uh, resp um, hemodynamic response functions, picking at different uh, latencies and convolved the signal with all of them and then used feature selection. Um, for a classifier, we used the random forest. This is a, a short pipeline of the approach. So we mapped the, the region of interest. We extracted the, the time course of the bold signal from the fMRI data on that, uh, on that row. And then this was our tar next target signal. And from the EG data, we performed feature extraction. On the scalp, we just used the, the multiple HRF convolution, but also than that, we can conducted source imaging, do some spatial filtering techniques, and then do the multiple HRF convolution. So our results, we see uh, we that the, the FP methods showed a very low correlation, correlation, only about 20%. And with our method, we were able to increase about 30 percentual points to the correlation achieved between the predicted bold by the, from the EG data and the real bold from the ROI. Also than that, we, we can see that we increased the, the anatomical validity of the, the reconstructed signal because we when we do this source uh, localization method, we see that uh, with the EFP method, we did not overlap a lot with the, the bold um, signal, which we see in blue. While on, the, on our method, we can see a nice overlap. We can see in green the, between the, the source signal predicted by, by our method and the original localizer. And then we look to the importance of the different features. Um, and we see that uh, the nonlinear features were having a group, uh, the most contribution to the um, to the to the method, and also that the theta and alpha frequency bands were the ones uh, most used. So in conclusion, we, we verified that nonlinear features might be important to capture bold relevant dynamics which improved the reconstruction accuracy of the model. Also, the convolution with multiple HRS functions uh, work better than the delays method or the simple HRF convolution. And we verified that this increased reconstruction is needed to achieve a, a better anatomic validity of the methods. 
there are still some work to do. We need to assess the generalization of these models. So how well these these generalize between uh, subjects and even for the same subject uh, for different sessions, because we see a lot of variability both between subjects and also intersubject. And we can see that in both modalities, both in the fMRI and on the EEG. So this is a, a big challenge that we need multi-session EEG fMRI data sets, which are very difficult to find on the literature. Also, we, we wanted to check if this method can be applied to other uh, non uh, neurofeedback tasks in different target regions, because this region is really challenging because it's small and it's in a sulcus. Uh, and I, also, there is this big question: the, then, how valid must an actual, uh, how accurate must uh, this reconstruction be so it is valid for transfer? Because we see that the method that gives us twenty percent correlation is already being uh, used and uh, validated in, the, in clinical trials. So we have this question to know how much is uh, needed to to verify the and apply the method. So this was my presentation and I am open for questions. Thank you very much. Um, that was a nice presentation. Hopefully this work brings us one step closer to translation of neurofeedback. We do have one question already in the chat box. Um, Shagun is asking, could you tell us about bold activity was predicted for how long in terms of future duration and how many scans? Okay, so we have, uh, uh, it was only one session, so one scan, um, but we did it on three runs, three different runs. Um, and what we did was we predicted each time, uh, time, point, time point HTR of the, of the bull signal using the previously 12 seconds of the EG. So we have 12 seconds in the past to predict this point um, because of the, the, the hemodynamic delay. What we did is we convolved this with different HRF responses. Um, and then we have this, this signal on these 12 seconds before. I'm not sure I responded to what uh, Sean was asking, but he may confirm. Sure. Any other questions? There's one more from Priyanka in the audience. Did the EEG have artifacts because of the simultaneous MRI scanning? And is the model applicable outside the MRI scanner? Okay, so yeah, this is the one of the big challenges of doing EEG fMRIs, the, the EEG contamination with the gradient artifacts, uh, the, the art artifact. Uh, so what we did was we conducted a pre-processing, a, a standard pre-processing method. Um, we can, we believe the, the data were correctly cleaned, so we are free of these artifacts. However, of course, this affects the quality of the, the EG, but it's the, well, I think it's the standard uh, EG fMRI procedure. So with these um, signals cleaned from, from artifacts, we were then trained the, the models. Uh, I believe the model is applicable outside of the MR scanner. Um, I think it does not depend at all of the MR scanner. We need the MR scanner to validate the model. Um, so, but if we, we could train the model using, imagine different conditions, so app regulation, non-regulation, and try to predict just these two states instead of a continuous prediction. What we are doing is a regression, so we can try to correlate the signal. But if we can imagine passing this to a um, uh, binary classification or multi uh, multi class classification, we can do it outside the scanner. Okay. Thank you. So we're almost done. We have time for one more question. If you have questions for the other panelists as well, Dr. Tate or Dr. Pei. So just a brief pause in case any more questions. Yeah, I'm just curious um, for Marco, the last talk, uh, do you have plans for a specific neurofeedback application? 
that you're targeting? Uh, well, this what we did here was we we did a, um, a clinical trial and intervention on autism spectrum disorder using this region, the PSTS okay. region, and uh, so what we were we saw some interesting results on the fMRI, but we we only did like five sessions, so we wanted to see if we can transfer this method to the EEG and we do it more in, uh, intensively, we can achieve a, a, better, a better result. So that was the main driver for this work. But I, I think we can do it on several different applications like motor rehabilitation, for instance, that is actually easier to perform. Got it. Um, so that would be interesting. Sounds good, thank you. Certainly, I'd be interested in the motor rehab applications for mm -hmm. sure. Again, thank you for all the, to all the speakers and to Taha for helping with moderating this session and have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day or night, wherever you are. Take care. I'm going to end the right. meeting. Bye-bye.